Laura Walters, thank you so much for sitting down with the Schumann Files. My pleasure. You're a member of European Parliament. Uh, you're Dutch. Uh, you sit with the Socialists and Democrats in the European Parliament, and this is your first term in Parliament. That's correct. How much of your time does meeting with lobbyists take up? I don't know. I'm going to say a fifth. So if you see them about a fifth of your time, they must be all over this place. There's definitely loads of them in Parliament. Should try and guess who who's passing by that might be a lobbyist? <laughs> this guy isn't because his badge is white. Ah. It's the brown badges. Brown badges. You need to look out for those. It's not the stickers. Those are visitors. Mm. I don't think we have a lobbyist in today. Not here at least. Probably in the bar over there. Is that where they like to corner you? The worst is the bar in Strasbourg where they will have a meeting with a member of parliament in the morning and then set up shop for the rest of the day. It's the members bar? It's the members bar. So it's only for MEPs? It's for MEPs and their invited guests. Okay. But if you go and you sit there for the rest of the day after the MEP has left, then you've got access to all the other ones. So you basically need a lobby bouncer? You do. Statistically, half the people here are in lobby meetings. I mean, I don't know if it's a real statistic, it's a gut feeling. So what does a typical day in the life of a member of European Parliament look like? Well, I wish there was such a thing as a typical day, but you'd probably have a committee meeting, so that means um, you go to talk with all your colleagues who sit on, say, the transport committee about a new law. Maybe you'll have a meeting, in my case, with an NGO that tells you about something in the world that needs to be changed. Um, you'll have things like interviews with journalists to tell the outside world about what's going on here. Um, and if you're lucky, you get to vote and actually decide on things that will make a difference. <sighs> Smells like democracy. Want to see the plenary? So let's talk a little about the, the practical way lobbyists try to um, influence decision makers. Uh, usually um, it's when uh, new laws are coming up, right? Yeah, when there's lawmaking happening, there's, there's lobbying. Because you're going to propose changes to those laws. That's right. So the way it works is usually the European Commission will write a proposal for a law and then us in the Parliament, we go through it with a red pen and we say, we like this or we don't like this, this needs to be changed. And that moment in time is a really important moment for lobbyists, but of course also for civil society organizations and others. What about the cases that we've read about where, uh, where amendments, uh, which is what changes are called um, yeah. to laws, um, are found to be copy-pasted? Yeah. That does happen, doesn't it? It does, it does. And I find it lazy lawmaking. But is it lazy if you agree with them? I mean, doesn't that free up more of your time to, to do other things? It's so important that as a member of parliament, um, that you use your own judgment, that you try to put your values into the law and into practice, um, and that maybe you take some things on board, or maybe you listen to some people, to companies or to NGOs or to others that will, that will be affected. Um, but there's a difference between that um, and doing that in a way that shows integrity and copy-pasting um, because people are pressuring you um, or because you're lazy. What is a creative way that a lobbyist might have approached you or your office? Creative ways are things like just walking around the corridors here and pretending that you bump into someone, I'd say. Um, when we go to vote, everybody knows that MEPs are expected in that room over there at a certain time. So if you're a good lobbyist, then you might try to, to wait over there and walk with us for a, for a little while. That's, a, wow. that's quite a ballsy way, I'd say, of approaching someone but it gets done. What is a, a shady or borderline thing where you from the get-go thought this isn't quite right, um, this, this doesn't fly? There was one invitation I got to a big dinner. It was a dinner hosted by a big newspaper and it was a dinner about Europe so it sounded like something that could be interested, that could be a nice evening out um, and I think it took me and my team 
uh, three readings of this email to see that no, actually it's not the newspaper inviting you to the dinner, it's a company that has bought a table at this dinner who is now inviting you to sit with them at that dinner so that they have access to you. Do you get gifts? Uh... Yeah, I get gifts sometimes. Um, flowers, um, for instance, or the other day I went to a company that makes sustainable water bottles um, and I got one. But there's rules on these things as well, because I guess what you're thinking about is what if people give you something super nice yeah. to buy your influence? Does that count as lobbying? Does that yeah. count as buying influence? Yeah. And where do you draw the line? Uh, I think it does count as buying influence if it's something that's too valuable. And so we've got rules on, I think, 150 euros max for gifts that members of the European Parliament get. But in my own case, in the uh, progressive group in Parliament, um, we've got a limit of 50 euros. Have you ever received anything more expensive? Yeah, I once received a purple snakeskin diary and when I Google googled it, it turned out to cost 300 euros. And I thought this is very expensive, very over the top and I can't with a good conscience keep this. Um, and so I, I sent it back immediately. Not even the part of you wanted to keep hold of it? It was really flashy, so either way, it wasn't. Okay, so it was an easy wasn't decision. Wasn't my style. Fair, fair, <laughs> fair. Uh, when do you feel like um, uh, someone is really trying to buy your or your institution's influence? It's difficult to say because I think it's a question of rules, but it's also a question of feeling and intuition. Um, but maybe to go back a step, I don't think that lobbying in itself is necessarily bad. I think the problems that we have are the problems that um, there's an inequality of arms when it comes to big companies that can afford lobbyists and lawyers buying things like tables at big dinners. And then you have civil society organizations, NGOs and others, and they don't have that capacity. And so I think it's important to say, fine, in a democracy, in a parliament, there should be a free flow of information. It's important that information reaches us um, and that we get to talk to people that makes our work better. But indeed, it's really important also to keep your radar on at all times and to think, um, what is it I think about this? And am I receiving information here or am I being unduly pressured? Is there money in play here? Um, am, I, am I breaking any rules? And I think that combination of rules and, and intuition is really important. What about just like not seeing lobbyists at all? Would free up a lot of time. Would free but, up. <laughs> but, uh, but bear in mind that lobbying does also come from NGOs, civil society, individuals who might have experienced something. Um, when we talk about lobbying, we often think about the very biggest companies, but lobbying is also any kind of, of pressuring from the outside world into the parliament. Um, and I wouldn't say no to, to all lobbying. Maybe just Crocs manufacturers? Because <laughs> it's, come on, it's a really ugly shoe. Okay, yeah, I, I, we can ban those. Thanks. <laughs> Great.